Good morning. Thank you for joining us this Easter Sunday morning. It is certainly the most uh, unusual Easter Sunday in my lifetime. And today will not be a conventional Easter Sunday message or even the Easter message that I expected to deliver a few weeks ago. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter one, the Lord told Jeremiah that when he preaches to the people, he should not look at their faces because that would just be discouraging to him. And it is true that uh, occasionally people's faces are discouraging to the speaker, but I would love to see you right now. And I can think of few things that would be more encouraging than to see your faces right now. We are built to thrive on social interaction, and there is nothing that can really replace it. You see that throughout the New Testament. The books of 2nd and 3rd John are short letters that the Apostle John wrote to close friends, and he closed both letters, saying that there were many things that he could write about, but he would save them until they could speak with one another face to face, and then our joy would be full. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, we endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. And so we also, in these weeks, forced for a short time to be apart, look forward to when we can again safely gather and speak with one another face to face. Easter on our calendar is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. It is the closest we can come to a commemoration of the day when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He was crucified on the sixth day of the week, what we call Friday. He rose early on the first day of the week. And it was also the feast of first fruits. It wasn't just any first day of the week. It was the day of the Feast of the First Fruits, and just this Passover was given to commemorate and anticipate the death of the Christ. So First Fruits was given to commemorate and anticipate his resurrection centuries before it happened. And so every Sunday, every first day of the week, we remember his death, and we proclaim his resurrection, and we tell with gladness the message of the gospel of salvation. And by tradition, the church sets aside this Sunday for all of us and welcoming those who uh, don't often attend church to reflect and reconsider that we, like him, can be raised to walk in newness of life uh, and, and that we, like him, can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, as we meet this Sunday, uh, now as we meet uh, this Sunday, uh, we, as we meet this Sunday, th this Easter Sunday, uh, America is living uh, under a time of a uh, pandemic, the COVID-19, the, the uh, novel coronavirus, the COVID-19. Cases have now exceeded 500,000. It has shut down cities, states, even nations, and caused fear throughout the world. And maybe you know somebody who has been affected by the virus, and I certainly do. To us, it's a unique experience, but throughout history, epidemics and plagues have been a recurring fact of life. The great flu pandemic of 1918 infected 500 million people and killed 20 million in just 25 weeks. Uh, for contrast, the uh, First World War killed 20 million in over four years. Pandemics were known to the writers of scripture from the deliverance of the psalmist to Jeremiah's prophecy to the pale horsemen of the uh, to, to, to the pale horsemen of the revelation the teachings of jesus changed the world's response to disease in ancient times sickness was seen as the judgment of the gods upon a person or on a community 
And in the words of Eliphaz, the comforter of Job, who ever perished being innocent? The sick were deemed worthy of their illness, and this pagan theology encouraged leaving them to their fate. But the gospel of Jesus Christ came with a new message of salvation that changed everything. And one of the things that it changed was the practice of medicine. In John chapter 9, Jesus saw a blind man and his disciples asked, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They presumed that the blindness was a result of some sin. Jesus responded that the reason for the blindness was not sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. When Jesus sent out the 12, he did so with a two-part charge, preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. He repeated the same charge to the 70 that went out before him in every city. Heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. And since that day, Christians have responded to disease with, with sympathy and cared for the sick medicinally and spiritually. And to some, it was given to heal the sick with miracles, but to the rest, with the skill of a physician and to all with the compassion of Christ. And in that skill and in that compassion, truly, the works of God are revealed and the kingdom of God comes near. Modern scholarship has shown the importance of this historical change. Gary Ferngren is a professor uh, at uh, Oregon State University. He's an authority in the history of medicine, especially in ancient times. And in his book, Medicine and Healthcare in Early Christianity, he shows how early Christians accepted the advances of Greek and Roman science and medicine, but also cared for the sick with a compassion previously unknown. Even during persecution, Christians cared for the sick within and outside of the community. When disaster befell a city, the Christians had both the compassion and the knowledge to care for those in need. Their medical charity, backed by their faith, led to the creation of the first hospitals. The whole idea of a hospital, the idea of a place to care for the sick, is a singularly Christian contribution to health care. This testimony was part of the great evangelical effort that changed the Roman Empire and created the moral foundation for Western society that we know today. And so this morning, I want to talk to you for these few minutes about the health and sickness, the strength and frailty of our bodies as the Bible presents it. And in part, my thoughts this Easter Sunday are going to build on the good word that Kyle Sobis brought two weeks ago. We'll be working together from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, so open your Bibles there, and if you are from Forge Road Bible Chapel and you don't have a Bible handy, just raise your hand and I am sure that Jebby will drive to your house and bring you one. Or uh, until he arrives, I'll put the verses up here on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. And we start with verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, to be well, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. And may the Lord bless giving us a good understanding of his word together. 
In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul is continuing a progression that began in chapter 4, where he wrote that God has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of his own glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul explained that this glory is, is not outward, but it is a spiritual, invisible, and eternal glory that is a great treasure, but is housed in these earthen vessels, these, these jars of clay, which are our body. And so having distinguished between the physical things that are passing away before our eyes and the spiritual things that are of eternal glory, he uses another analogy comparing our bodies to a tent. He speaks, of, uh, he speaks in verse 1 as our earthly house, which he calls this tent. Now, the Bible explains that the real person is inward and spiritual. The real you is not this flesh. It's not muscle and tissue and bone and sinew. You are much more than muscle and tissue and bone and sinew. You're much more than the algorithms that constantly run throughout your brain and the central nervous system. The real you, the real me, is inward and spiritual. The body is just a, a house where I'm living right now. And the image of the body as a house is one that runs throughout the Bible. Solomon in Ecclesiastes 12 built a, a detailed analogy about getting old he used the idea of an old house with window panes that were cloudy and music volume always being too low. Popular culture has picked this up as well. There was a medical drama that ran from 2004 into 2012. It was seen in 66 countries, and in 2008, it was the most watched television program in all the world. And being a medical drama, it was by definition all about the human body. The name of the program was the name of the doctor, House. Now Paul takes that image and takes it even further. He says that our earthly house is actually just a tent. And I suppose that uh, many of you, most of you, have slept in a tent from one time or another. Trail Life is sponsoring a national backyard uh, camp out on April 17. If you, want in for, if you want opportunity to sleep in a tent, you can just call Steve Paget about that. And if you were with us uh, two weeks ago, you might remember that this is what Kyle Sobis thinks a tent should look like. Uh, I can remember two occasions in my life when I've slept in a tent. Uh, one week, I hiked the Appalachian Trail with John Davids and two of his sons. John and I shared a tent. Uh, it didn't look anything like uh, Kyle's tent. Uh, John was in full lieutenant colonel mode that week, and it's the closest I've ever come to being in the Army. And then there was a time when my wife Vicki uh, and, and I did the cycle across Maryland some years ago. We bicycled 50 to 100 miles every day, and then we slept in a small tent. And that didn't look anything like Kyle's tent either. And it rained constantly. And let's just say that that is a week that Vicki keeps reserved in a very special place in her memory. You use a tent when you're moving from one place to another. You set it up, you take it down, you move it with you as you go. And two weeks ago, Kyle talked to us about the tabernacle in the wilderness, which is where the Lord Jehovah dwelt with the people of Israel. And going through the wilderness together, you lived in your tent, and the Lord lived in his tent so that he would dwell among us. Kyle pointed out how the Apostle John picked up on that idea in the first chapter of his gospel, and it was the word that he used in the famous verse that the word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory the words dwelled among us are literally tabernacled among us. The Son of God upon the earth lived in a tent. Lived in a tent just like I do and just like you do. 
The writer of the Hebrews takes this image further still, that Christ's body was like the veil of the tabernacle that separated the most holy place and described his death as, as, as the, the, the tearing and the ripping and the renting of the fabric of that veil and of that tent. Paul made tents for a living. He had done so when he worked in Corinth for 18 months. So it was an easy illustration for him to reach for as he, as he writes back to them. I suppose he was thinking of something more like this, a tent built to hold just one guy. It's not fancy, it's not permanent, and it's not home. And so the Lord has fashioned a tent for each one of us. It's not fancy, and it's not permanent, and it's not home. And this is the same image that the apostle Peter used to describe his life. Peter wrote in his second letter that so long as I am in this tent, I think it is right to stir you up, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as the Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. That's the way Peter spoke of his death. I'm going to take down my tent. A tent is just a place for the time being. Abraham was a wealthy man, but he lived in a tent. His life was a pilgrimage, and he was looking for something permanent, for a city which had foundations and whose builder and maker was God. That's what Paul was talking about when he says in verse 1 that if our tent, our earthly house, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a great house, an eternal mansion in the heavens. Now, this great house he's talking about is not a reference to the city of heaven with its transparent gold and its gates of pearl. Rather, Paul is speaking here what we will be, what our bodies will be when we are raised and changed at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ so that what dies and is buried in corruption is raised in incorruption and what is buried in dishonor is raised in glory and what is buried in weakness is raised in power. And Paul says, I can't wait. I can't wait for that day when death is swallowed up in victory and when this mortal has put on immortality. I can't wait for the kingdom of Jesus Christ to come upon the earth when injustice and sufferings and pandemics are no more. Or in the words of verse 2, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. And so asks Paul, why should I be focusing on that which is by definition temporary when I have before me an exceeding and eternal weight of glory? This virus has the potential to do terrible things to the tent, but it cannot touch the inward man that I am, and it cannot reach the eternal habitation that the Lord is preparing for me. Now, given this subject, and given our circumstances and the necessity of being apart, I thought this morning to tell you a story to illustrate this point. And to some of you, parts of this story are going to be very familiar and it will bring back memories. And to others, it will be brand new. But whether this story sounds new or old, you might be a part of it. Jesus said that the one who sows and the one, there's one who sows and one who reaps, but all rejoice together. Paul wrote that he who plants and he who waters are one, for there is one harvest given of the Lord. And so some of us have known one another for many years, and some of us only briefly. But I'd like to tell you a story in which we can all rejoice together. The story starts when a man named A.S. Loazzo, who some of you knew, who I met, I only remember meeting once when I was very young and he was very old. Well, he donated two lots on Goodview Road. And in 1952, a funny looking little building was built there. It was called Hillendale Bible Chapel. And there a group of Christians gathered and struggled and prospered until 1995. And in 1995, we then moved our Sunday morning meetings 
to Pine Grove Middle School, where we met for about seven years. Maybe there was something biblical about being there for seven years. And for seven years, every Sunday, we would set up and take down what we needed for services that day. And then in 2001 and 2002, we built the building at Forge Road, which became Forge Road Bible Chapel. Now we had a contractor, George Brown of Total Construction, who actually built many churches throughout Maryland and went home to be with the Lord a few years ago. But if you were around then, well, you know what I mean when I say we built this building. Over those 18 months or so, I would be, repeat, I would be repeatedly amazed by the talent, the skill, and the energy that so many brought day after day as we built this building together. Whether it was carpentry or electrical, whether it was law or landscaping, whether it was furnitures or fixtures, it seemed like there was no job for which we did not have someone with the skill, someone with the tools, someone with the time and the energy to get it done. Together, we faced every challenge. Together, we rededicated ourselves against every setback. And together, we rejoiced in the accomplishments of every day. It didn't matter if we were outside digging in the dirt or if we were inside lifting, lifting lights to the ceiling. We worked together through the summer and the winter, through the spring and the fall. From the oldest of us to the youngest of us, we had workers and we had energy in abundance. We had workers like the Egyptians had frogs during the plagues. Now we met at Pine Grove Middle School for almost seven years. And during those seven years, I never once heard a group of men and women say, hey, let's all go out next Saturday and work all day and fix things up around Pine Grove Middle School. But that's what we did here. Nobody said, let's uh, scrub and vacuum all the floors at the school, but we did it together here. Nobody labored over wallpaper and paint samples to determine how to make the rooms, even the bathrooms of the school look nice. But somebody did it here. Nobody suggested that we buy really nice chairs for the school or wash the windows at the school. Vicki was in charge of laying out the garden. So while at my law office, my name is on the door, here I just became unskilled labor. And I can tell you with assurance that at no time did it ever occur to me to go to Pine Grove Middle School so I could shovel truckloads full of mulch. And while we were at the school, no one ever came up with the idea to have a nursery which would boast a mural on the walls to rival the Sistine Chapel. Why not? I mean, we were the same people at the school. We had the same talent, we had the same skills, we had the same energy, we had the same monetary resources, we had the same love for the Lord, we had the same commitment to the gospel. Why is the very idea of doing such things at the school ridiculous? But here, the logic of doing them is so compelling that men and women poured countless hours into the project. Well, we all know what the answer is. The answer is, we were not staying at the school. We didn't know how long we would be there, but we knew it wasn't forever. It wasn't ours. No amount of work or money or time could ever make it ours. Do we take care of the school? Sure. It was important that we did. It was right that we did. It was a good testimony that we did. Things ran well and we accomplished things for Jesus Christ because we did. But we never really bought anything good for the school and we were just tenants paying rent. Did we see blessings at the school? Sure, great blessings. People were saved at the school. People grew in their faith at the school. But nobody suggested that the blessings of God were so great at the school that we should abandon the goal of the building. 
for years, we sat on metal chairs. People would bring their own cushions to mark their chairs and nobody complained about them. They were fine for the school. But nobody suggested that, that, we, that we should bring those metal chairs and set them up in the new building. And why not? Because that was temporary and this is permanent, at least for our time. And for me, it was all captured in one planning meeting. We were discussing whether to do this or that and Norris Gorman said, this is the building where I'm gonna go to church for the rest of my life. We should make it as good as we can. Now the Apostle Paul takes exactly that concept and he applies it to a principle which arcs over all of our lives. We live in a tent. It's not permanent, it's not home. Are there blessings while I'm in the tent? Sure. The glory of God resides within my body as a light within an earthen vessel, and by the grace of God, it can be an instrument of righteousness. Should I take care of this tent? Most certainly I should. It's not the mansion, but it's the best I've got right now. I have a very good physical therapist who is helping me to rehab that part of the tent called my left knee to get it back into shape. I need to keep my life orderly and functional and healthy, the same way we keep the school. Such things were honoring to God and a testimony to men. But I'm a fool if I treat this tent like my permanent home and ignore what's eternal. And I am short-sighted in the extreme if I spend my time and my money and my intellect and my energy working on the tent and fixing up the tent and buying really great stuff for the tent so that people would come by and say, wow, that's a great tent you got there. I, I mean, there's only so much stuff you can get for the tent. Rather quickly, all it does is become superfluous and clutter up your life and quickly became, become a pain to haul around with you and actually can look rather silly. And yet there are so many people and so many Christians who live their lives working on the tent and buying things for the tent and fixing up the tent, never understanding that one day this is all going to get folded up. And so if on one of those Saturday work days when Bill Gardini or Mark Francis was gathering men to work at this build, at the building, somebody said, well, I'm going to go over to the school and I'm going to go work over there. He would say, hey, you're working on the wrong building. Many Christians today, they're saved, praise the Lord, but they're working on the wrong building. Now, Paul says that while we're in this tent, we groan. And I don't know about you, but for me, there's nothing like sleeping outdoors in a tent to make you ache and pain all over and to hurt for days. In this tent, we groan being burdened. Successes pass quickly and things get old fast. There is joy and honor in our lives, but living in this tent can be a burden. Sin, sin dwells in my flesh and no matter what I do today, it will be there when I wake up tomorrow. We read in verse 6 that while we are in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And then in verse 8, the reciprocal is true, that we are confident that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So there are some days where you just want to put in a call and to find out when that house eternal in the heavens will be ready for you to take occupancy. Now, please understand, I'm not talking about dying, and Paul is not talking about dying. He's saying in verse 4 that it's not that I want to be unclothed. Death is not a good last answer. It's not an escape. It's not our friend. The Bible says it is our enemy and is not just a natural part of life. Paul was talking about the day when mortality is swallowed up in victory. He's anxiously awaiting the return of the Lord and for God to finish what he started when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. If you ever bought a house, you know, the closer you get to moving day, the more you anticipate it. As you come in our front door, there's a verse that's set in a stone, Hebrews 10, 25. It's also on the homepage of our website. For not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, 
but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. The writer tells us to exhort one another, and so much more as we see the day approaching, or as we read in Romans, that now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. In other words, the coming of the Lord and the resurrection is sooner today than when you first trusted in Jesus Christ. In fact, it's sooner this Easter than it was last Easter, and it's closer today than it's ever been before. Now to some people, those will be just nice words. You know, when we started services at Pine Grove Middle School, we didn't own any land and it wasn't altogether sure that we ever would. We didn't have the money to build. It wasn't sure that we ever would. And some were more confident than others. We formed the building committee, or Roger Dunkerton and John Davids and Paul Dumb and William Arthur Dunkerton, and, and they did a great job. But with neither the land nor the money, things were pretty theoretical. And from time to time, we would hear a report, maybe at an annual business meeting, and we just all listen politely and nod. And then the land was found and purchased if things were less theoretical, we were looking at real alternatives. A real budget started to be outlined. There were still many hurdles and there was still the issue of money and it was still a long way off. The committee reported to the chapel, eh, maybe quarterly. A real plan for construction was put up. People began to comment on it. Somebody figured out how to put the money together and raise the money. People began to look at it with more seriousness. Excitement started to grow. A construction contract was negotiated and signed. And now the committee gave a report every month, first Sunday of the month. People started to see, go out to have a look as work was progressing. Help started to pour in and we took all the help we could get. And now everybody was asking the same question. How soon? How far out? What remains to be done? And now Roger Duncan was reporting every week. And now people were talking about target dates. Is it going to be May or July or September? And now there were teams that were there all the time and everybody could taste it. And then I remember the day, maybe some of you do too. When Roger stood up on a Sunday morning and he said, five, five weeks, five weeks to go, and we're going to be in the new building, and everybody applauded. Next week, Roger stood up again. He said, we got four weeks to go. And then the next week, Roger stood up again. He said, we got four weeks to go. And the next, thing, next week, Roger stood up again. He said, we got four weeks to go. You know, uh, Joshua in the Bible, he's, he's got nothing on Roger. Joshua made the sun stand still for one day. Roger made time stop for a month. I think we were stuck on that four weeks to go stuff for I don't know how long. I began to think I was going to be like, like Moses. I was going to see it with my eyes, but I was going to die before we all went in and that our children were going to go in instead of us. And then the last hurdle was cleared. And then the countdown was rolling again. Three weeks to go, two weeks. Stay by your phones, we said. That's what you had to do then. You couldn't carry your phones with you. Stay by your phones. And on the day that the use and occupancy permit was issued, I was out of town. And when I got back, the messages on my voicemail at work and at home were jammed. Everybody calling everybody. Everybody saying the same thing. Did you hear? We've got a date. This is real. And by the way, that's what's going to happen when the current restrictions are lifted and we get a date to go back. See, as we saw the day approaching, excitement grew, anticipation grew, the sense of urgency grew, the sense of purpose grew, the effort grew, all because we saw the day approaching. Now, my brothers and my sisters and my friends, 
There are some people, and to them, the gospel and the promises of the Lord and the promises of all things being made right, well, it's just a theoretical thing. They listen politely. They move through life with no sense of spiritual urgency and without any expectation that there's something beyond this tent in which we dwell. But if many live like that, the Apostle Paul says, not me, and I trust to God, not you, and not us. He writes in verse 9 that our aim is to be well-pleasing to him. Our aim is not to succeed in business or get ahead in the world. Our aim is definitely not to be religious or even to build a nice building. All such things might make an impressive tent if we wanted to boast in our appearances, but our aim, whether present or absent, whether here or there, is to be well-pleasing unto God. Paul writes in verse 5 that we are prepared for this life by God himself. God has prepared us for this life of being a pilgrim and never at home until we're at home with him. God has prepared us for this life in the weakness of the flesh. God has prepared us, even if needs be, for the burdens and the sorrow and the groaning of our days in the flesh. And I know it is hard. I know that it's hard. But it is surely worth the effort. And it is surely worth the wait. Was it worth the wait and worth the effort to build this building? Yeah, it was. For the sake of those who have heard the gospel and been saved there, it was worth the effort. And for those who have joined us over the years, for you who have joined us over the years, well, we built this building expecting you. We didn't know your names, but we were expecting you. And the one who plants and the one who waters and the one who sows and the one who reaps all share in the same harvest and we are one together. And for the sake of those who will be encouraged and built up in the faith, for the sake of our children, for the sake of our marriages and our families, for the sake of those who are in trouble and don't have anywhere else to go, for the joy of our fellowship together, for those who will hear the gospel every Sunday, for those who hear the gospel today, it was surely worth the wait and surely worth the effort. And God himself has prepared us for this life and he has given us his spirit as our guarantee of what is yet unseen. You know, we've been here now almost 20 years and I have yet to hear anybody say, I really miss the school. I miss the metal chairs. I miss the setup and the takedown. (laughs) No, nobody has said that. When we shall be where we would be, When we shall be where we should be, when things that are not now nor could be are our own, none of us will miss what we once were. This church building is a great place. This is where I'm going to go to church for the rest of my life. But really, it's no permanent that was the school. It's really just another place to serve the Lord and another place to work together while we wait for his son from heaven. And so if as a group we made such a great commitment for a place that is actually just another temporary stop on the journey, then what should our commitment be to things that are really eternal? Now this Sunday that building is closed and for important reasons. We join with our whole community in stopping the spread of the, vi- of the virus. The building is closed, but our church most certainly is not. The Apostle Peter wrote that we, the people, are living stones that build the church. Every one of us, a brick, a step, a pillar, a stone that builds up unto God a spiritual house that offers up sacrifices through Jesus Christ. So if you hear that churches are closed, don't you believe it? And actually this morning, in the few minutes just before we went live, I could think of nothing, I could think of nothing but you. Nothing but us. 
sitting down in our homes and with our families, computers clicking on, logging on, us coming together around the good news of Jesus Christ. And there is nothing in the world better than being a Christian. We read in Ephesians, Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. The whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. The Lord bless you and your family this Easter, and we will see one another soon. Thank you for listening. I'm now going to give it back to Bill for a hymn, and then Jack Terzu will take us out. The Lord bless you this Easter Sunday. Praise God, that was an impressive presentation. I wonder how they got that tuba on top of the rock, but that was amazing. Um, we praise God that Jesus gave us a firm foundation to build our house. He made us living stones of his church, and we certainly do look forward to being with him in eternity 
And we do look forward to all of us being able to be together again at Forge Road Bible Chapel. We remember that Jesus died in our place, and we believe that in his rising from the dead, we are justified, and we wait with joyful anticipation for his return. Let us pray, and uh, then we'll break from there, and we can all enjoy Easter with our families. Lord, we just thank you so much for the gracious gift of your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you that you have given us a great home, Lord, in your son, Jesus Christ, and you have fit us together like living stones, working with one another and being built with one another. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody who uh, has heard this message this morning and they desire a relationship with you, Jesus, that, Lord, they would find this time now to just draw close to you and to pray. And, Lord, we know that you are faithful and just to receive such a one, Lord, uh, who would put their faith in you. And so, God, I pray that you would bless us now, that you would keep us, and that we would all be together soon to rejoice together. We praise you and we bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.